we are live. Hello and welcome to TUC's webinar Q&A on Brexit. I'm here with Steve Turner, United's Assistant General Secretary, as well as TUC General Counsel's spokesperson on Europe, so the best person to ask questions about Brexit <laughs> in our movement. Uh, there are three ways to participate, actually two. We have just narrowed one of them down so we can just see your questions easier. You could go to ask a question and the slide is up and you can ask your questions of Steve that you have. We have already four questions in and we're going to do this for half an hour so, so get your questions in and we'll ask them that way. And also you can comment and chat so if somebody said something interesting do come back to them and you know if you hear something interesting that myself or Steve say come back to that and we can respond to that as well. Alright, I'm going to start with two questions from me and then we'll open it up to some participants. First question, Steve, post-Brexit referendum. What was the sort of trade union movement response and where did you want to go after the result? Well, I think the first point to say is that we recognise the outcome of the referendum. The people of the United Kingdom voted and voted to leave the European Union. So at some point where we leave in the European Union, uh, the government indicated that that will be on the 19th of March next year. Um, our position from the outset was to make sure that workers themselves aren't paying the price, whether they be European workers or indeed UK workers, and to ensure that we retained investment and a strong economy in the UK that benefited all of us. Uh, you need a strong economy to protect public services as we move forward, whether that's the health service or local services provided by local government. Uh, people need to be paying taxes for that and employers need to be successful. And of course, the reality is that so many of both our members and employers in the UK are pretty much wholly reliant on business and trade with the European Union. And, you know, Brexit is a complex issue. We found this out in the, over the last, you know, since the referendum, 18 months or so. There are new things coming up all the time. How does the trade union movement try to assess a deal that we get at the end of Brexit? Well, we've developed our own five key planks of an agreement, uh, really, that we would ensure that workers are indeed not paying the price of a Brexit. So protection for frictionless trade, uh, the customs union is incredibly important for tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of workers that rely on trade with the European Union. I deal with employers myself in the uh, automotive and aerospace sectors where components will cross the North Sea uh, between partners, even in the same company, 15 times during the course of a manufacturing process. And any uh, restrictions on trade, any tariffs that may be imposed, uh, any red tape or bureaucracy that would slow down the process of trade between the UK and the European Union would be incredibly detrimental to our competitiveness. Yeah. And that's about employers then making future investment decisions mm -hmm. that could be to the detriment of plants here in the UK. Yeah. And that's very real. Um, and so we're incredibly supportive of protecting our trade relations with the European Union. And then making sure that there's a level playing field on workers' rights. And effectively the UK doesn't become uh, some offshore haven uh, for the disruption of the financial system in the European Union or indeed rights that workers uh, receive as a consequence of our membership of the European Union. So that's not just about what we've got now, that's making sure that we don't fall behind rights as they develop in the European Union. If we're going to have a trading relationship we can't be the second class citizens within that trading relationship. So that's incredibly important. We need to make sure that if there are dis disputes, if we're not part of the European Court of Human Rights or the European, uh, the European Court of Justice uh, for dispute resolution, then we need to have a mechanism in place to make sure that uh, remedies are very quickly achieved mm -hmm. um, between ourselves and businesses operating in Britain and those in the European Union itself making sure that workers have got a say and indeed making sure that um, you know the citizens of Europe uh, the movement uh, between European countries of those citizens that have either come to the UK now with their families of course or the millions of UK citizens that live across Europe making sure that we protect the rights of those um, citizens as we uh, move out of the European Union formally its political um, structures and making sure fundamentally for us of course that there's no disruption that could lead to um, difficulties in uh, Ireland mm -hmm. as a consequence of uh, border protectionism uh, between the North and South yeah. and the undermining of Good Friday Agreement. So that's a sort of really comprehensive set of things that address multiple sort of concerns that people yeah. have from business, from workers that want to, for example, challenge a ruling and take it to European court and get justice that way, from sort of citizens that are here and British citizens that are living abroad. Yeah. 
all of that, what what does what does those sort of tests come to when you're looking at what options are? Well, our, our position from the start has been that you, we're negotiators. Yeah. So you leave all options on the table. Mm -hmm. um, we're not ruling anything in and we're not ruling anything out. Uh, whatever the eventual outcome uh, is must meet our core demands. Mm -hmm. And that could be met in a variety of different ways. We're not saying that we should remain in the customs union, but we are insistent that we have a relationship that includes a customs union, mm -hmm. a customs union. Um, and you can call it what you like. It could look as it looks, as long as it does what it says on the tin. Mm -hmm. You don't have to call it a customs union, but the, the, the ability of our industry, our, our businesses, uh, to be able to trade freely and without restriction mm -hmm. with our largest single market in the European Union is incredibly uh, is incredibly important. So we're ruling nothing in and we're ruling, uh, we're putting nothing out of course. Mm -hmm. uh, we leave it uh, on the table for the negotiators to reach the best possible settlement that they can but we want to make sure that we're at the table when it comes to that uh, negotiations commencing. Yeah. And sort of I think I'm going to go to one of the questions that we have here mm -hmm. and we were talking about sort of customs union and there is a question about whether a customs union with the EU will make trade with Commonwealth countries and other countries a trade deal with them less likely what are the sort of what are the trade-offs in that of a you know having a customs union with a single market with yeah. the EU versus you know going out and trying to get deals with other countries or well, I'm quite pragmatic about this. I mean, the reality is our relationship with the European Union is not just a single market in a customs union with the European Union itself, the other 27 member states. Uh, that um, Between them, uh, you know, realise the largest single trading partner for us, mm -hmm. the European Union. It's also the 750 trade agreements that the European Union have got, of which we are a signatory, yeah. uh, with other countries around the world. Um, and when we leave the European Union, we also walk away from the 750 trade agreements See, yeah. that the European Union have signed on our behalf. Uh, and therefore, to believe that um, we can make up that trade deficit by signing individual agreements with individual previously Commonwealth countries, perhaps, or maybe even others like the United States or Canada or Australia, and that will make up for the deficit in trade as a consequence of leaving the European Union, uh, is farcical. Uh, in, in my view. So we have to find a way in which we leave the European Union with a customs union in place to protect mm -hmm. our relationships, yeah. not just with the EU but with those countries that have signed agreements with the EU, mm -hmm. of which we are a party, yeah. uh, also enable us the freedom to be able to explore agreements with other countries outside the EU at the moment mm -hmm. on our own behalf. Yeah. And I think that's eminently possible if the government go to the European Union with a more constructive and positive approach. Mm -hmm. Of course, at the moment, all we're doing is insisting on red lines that we won't cross. Yeah. And that's no way to approach a negotiation. Uh, any shop steward or rep out there or officer that's listening into this mm. webcast will know that if you want to get the best deal that you can, you don't go into a negotiation with a load of red lines. Yeah. You, you go in with an open mind, you go in with a piece of paper, you go in with a thought about what you want to get at the end. Mm -hmm. um, but during the course of those negotiations, you'll wheel and deal to get the best possible deal that you can. That's great. And I think uh, we have more questions, more space for questions, so if you have questions, go to the question section, add them in. Another question we have from Lawrence Goodchild says, what employers can do to protect EU citizens? What should reps do? You know, we have EU citizens that are members of the union. What should reps do in terms of going to management and asking questions, I think? And I think that comes on the back of this week we found the app that government had sort of put out for EU citizens wasn't on Apple phones, on iPhones, so 52% of people in the UK couldn't access it, so within that confusion and you know it's a, it's a trying time for those people who are less certain about what the future might be like. Absolutely, and we've been clear that EU citizens are very welcome. This is not um, a dispute between workers uh, that's taking place here. This is a political uh, negotiation that's taking place that workers can't be allowed to pay the price for. So we have many, uh, many millions of EU citizens living and working in the UK, just as we have many millions of UK citizens living and working indeed elsewhere across the European Union. And our position has been very clear that they currently benefit from a series of rights as, a mem as members of the European Union. Uh, when we leave the European Union, the government has indicated that all of those rights will be transferred to UK yeah. law. 
what we would ask reps to do very quickly actually is to secure those rights by way of a written agreement mm -hmm. uh, with their employers. And many of our reps out there have already signed agreements with employers that, you know, in a, a negotiated sense, mm -hmm. ensure that the rights of those migrant workers that are working currently in the UK are protected, as are their jobs, mm -hmm. uh, are protected into the future. And that's incredibly important. You know, after the referendum, we were in a very difficult uh, position uh, here. I met many, many workers that feared for themselves mm -hmm. and feared for their families as well, thinking that, you know, a coach was going to turn up outside a workplace and they were going to be depo deported from the UK. It was incredibly stressful and difficult time for them. And in some places that's still mm -hmm. uh, the case. The, the insecurity yeah. that's come about as a consequence of the referendum result is incredibly difficult for people. Um, so our, our position is that reps should do all they can to reassure mm -hmm. uh, our colleagues from across the European Union that not just are they welcome and they make it welcome, uh, absolute contribution uh, to the UK, not just in terms of work and to the economy, but their culture and the vibrancy that that brings to the UK is very welcome, and indeed they're welcome into the future as well, and we won't stand by and allow their rights uh, to be undermined in any way. Mm -hmm. That's great, and I think one question that we have is, looking at Brexit, what do you think the impact of Brexit is on the trade union movement? If we look at our own movement for a bit, what do you think are the challenges that we face as a movement, as reps, as people that are trying to defend workers' rights, to are trying to negotiate better pay and conditions at the workplace? Well, we do what we've always done. Uh, we're as powerful as our weakest link. You know, we negotiated and secured many rights before we joined the European Union. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, we're a political force yeah. uh, to be reckoned with and will continue to be a political force here in the UK outside of the European Union. Yeah. Uh, you never get anything if you're not prepared to fight for it. Yeah. <laughs> and our fathers and our mothers and grandparents previously have fought incredibly hard, not just to build a movement that we can rightly be proud of today, but to secure a whole host of rights, many of which were then reinforced yeah. as a consequence of our membership of the European Union. Uh, by way of European directives or regulations, mm -hmm. and they were extended as well as a consequence of our membership of the European Union. You know, as a trade union movement, we're now going to have to rekindle that fire yeah. uh, that got us to the point whereby we're powerful enough, mm -hmm. uh, not just to be listened to uh, by government, but uh, for our voice to be taken into account and for us to be able to win the security that our members are looking for and our families subsequently will be looking for uh, whilst outside of the European Union. Yeah. It's going, to be, uh, it's going to be difficult for us. Um, you know, we're stronger together. The European trade union movement has made fantastic inroads into mm -hmm. exploitation across the European Union and the European Union for our involvement has had influence elsewhere around the world to try and stop some of the worst exploitation, wherever that may be, whether that's child labour breaking ships in Bangladesh mm -hmm. or slavery elsewhere. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, the European Union is a, a power for good mm -hmm. and we're part of the structures of the European Union through the European Trade Union Confederation, our European mm -hmm. Trade Union movement that's allowed us to be able to use our influence elsewhere around the world as well, which strengthens all of us. Yeah. We all benefit from improvements in rights and better security for people, dignity at work, wherever that might be. So I think another question that we have is, I think, from Frederick. And Frederick asked something that I've heard before of, if we voted to leave, yeah. Why haven't we left yet? And I think that, that <laughs> yeah. you, know, you, know, you know that's uh, that's that's something that sort of you know we should ask the government. I think you know government is in charge of negotiating. But in, from, from from your point of view, what do you think? What do well, you I hear that. Frederick? I, I hear that. I hear what Frederick's mm. saying, and I hear that in workplaces up and down the country, and I hear it in my local pub mm. um, as well, and on the bus on the way home. It, you know. It's, uh, it's a common held view. The reality is it's not quite as straightforward um, as that. We've got to untangle ourselves from a relationship that's taken us many, many decades actually um, to build uh, mm -hmm. with our partners in the European Union. And whilst we need to un untangle that to free ourselves yeah. constitutionally of the European Union, we've got to do that in a way in which ordinary working people don't pay the price. Yeah. There would be many people that would just want us to become this offshore haven um, a tax haven out, uh, outside of the European Union and indeed an economy in which workers' rights weren't protected and that we were a race to the bottom, involved in a race to the bottom uh, in terms of workers' rights and terms and conditions. Uh, the reality is uh, we're not going to allow that to happen. 
And so we have to go through a process that enables us to uh, secure those sorts of protections for our members mm -hmm. and secure the sorts of protections we need for the industries that employ our people mm -hmm. uh, as we move forward. And that does mean getting into difficult, sensitive discussions about uh, customs union, mm -hmm. about access to the single market, uh, about our trading relations not just with the European Union but with the European Union's partners mm -hmm. because we'll also be leaving those relationships yeah. as we said earlier. So it's, it's not an easy negotiation. If you, if you take Ireland, for instance, uh, you know, Ireland will remain a part of the European Union. There will be a border um, between the European Union and the UK. Right now, without an agreement, that border will be between the Republic of Ireland and the North of Ireland. Mm -hmm. Now, that puts us in an incredibly difficult and dangerous situation, undermining the Good Party Agreement, the uh, Belfast Arrangements, and indeed the peace process. Mm -hmm. that's been in place now that we've all benefited from um, since the 1990s, the mid-1990s. And, you know, we're all clear, all very clear, that we can't see a hard ball to return. Mm -hmm. uh, that has to be negotiated. Uh, that's a difficult one. That has to, uh, you know, it's going to take time and we need to find a sensible resolution, um, a political resolution to that. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's government's job. Yeah. All right. Uh, we have, if, we, if you could send more questions in, we have a bit more time. I think we have a new question as well, and that is, how does Brexit affect the ability of UK unions to work with sister unions internationally to stop race to the bottom? Well, it doesn't. Um, it doesn't really. We'll still remain a party to the European Trade Union Confederation. Mm -hmm. uh, the ETUC is the constitutional trade union forum, federation uh, in the European Union, but it's already got membership from outside of the European Union. Um, so our, our membership is retained. Okay. Uh, our influence is retained. Of course, where we find it difficult is, as UK unions alone, wanting to step into discussions with the European Commission or any one of the uh, relevant bodies that make up the European Union that we may want to enter into negotiations or discussions with to safeguard the interests of members yeah. in particular sectors. We won't have access mm -hmm. to those structures anymore, not directly anyway, yeah. but of course we will have those structures um, via the European Trade Union Confederation. And we've got a very proud record of solidarity and internationalism uh, as a movement, mm -hmm. individual unions and as a TUC mm -hmm. as well, and not just with the European Union partners, but around the world, in Latin America and in Australia, in Eastern Europe, uh, and indeed in North America. We have very good relationships and we'll maintain all of those. That's great. So I think, I think we have one more question. It's quite a bit of a longer one. Uh, I'm going to let Steve uh, sort of read through it but I think we had a sort of the thing is we had an internationalist rally in Paris in 2016 we had people all across Europe and I'm just trying to come to good uh, what, what is proposed to support workers fighting to keep working safety and other standards won by workers the same across Europe yeah so I think you know it's a similar nature to question but in terms of like I think you've had experience of trying to represent members with sort of who work for multinational companies, if you could go in a little bit into that of how sort of I remember you sort of unite successfully defended Bombardier workers in Northern yeah. Ireland, but far back maybe that's a good example to give a little bit of context to people of how solidarity works across yeah, the world. We have no intention of sitting back and allowing our rights, um, whether they've been achieved here in the UK over many, many generations or whether they've been achieved as a consequence of our involvement and membership of the European Union uh, to be taken away from us. Yeah. Uh, so we're not going to sit back and allow any of that to happen. Uh, the reality is uh, employers out there and certainly some governments of course will get away with what we allow them to get away with. Yeah. Uh, and that's a question of our own power and our own level of organisation. Mm -hmm. uh, are we in a position in a workplace or inside a company to give that company a problem if they come for us yeah. tomorrow? Um, we have very, very good relationships with many employers out there and we have uh, employers that tolerate us yeah. uh, in others. I mean that's the reality of life. Yeah. Uh, why they don't come for us very often is because they know they'll get a reaction mm -hmm. uh, if they do. And um, you know, that's our job. That's mm -hmm. our job as trade unionists to defend what we have today but to advance our interests as well. Yeah. We're not happy with the employment situation as we see it right now in the UK. We're not happy uh, with the level of employment protection or mm -hmm. employment rights that we currently uh, benefit from uh, here in the UK. And it's a constant power struggle. 
for us to improve upon those rights. And we'll continue to do that, of course. That's uh, the function of trade unions. But we'll also work with other parties uh, around the world to represent the interests of our members. And you raised Bombardier. Bombardier is a very good example where it was actually in the United States that our members' jobs in the UK were being threatened. Yeah. Uh, 10,000 workers in the UK's jobs were absolutely being threatened as a consequence of a case being taken in the United States. And I was uh, at the front of a campaign led by my own union, United, of course, uh, with our members in the United States. We travelled to Washington, we travelled to Montreal, we lobbied. Um, you know, we met powerful individuals and groups in the United States uh, where, that we could influence in order to make that decision one that benefited our members and protected yeah. our jobs. And in the end, we won uh, yeah. that case. I mean, that just takes hard work. Yeah. That takes hard work and relationships. And those relationships aren't gained overnight. They're long-term relationships that we've built over many, many generations with our partner unions elsewhere uh, around the world. As I said before, we're an internationalist movement, mm -hmm. and we have to be. Uh, so many of the employers that we deal with are global companies. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and those global companies will be making decisions on the next investment, uh, the next product, um, in boardrooms, not necessarily in the UK, maybe in Detroit or in Chicago or in uh, Bonn or Munich or wherever it may be around the world, actually, Tokyo or South Africa. But they'll be making decisions and there's nothing nationalistic about capital. Mm -hmm. It will move to maximise its profit wherever it can. And our job as trade unionists is to make sure that we step in the way of that process yeah. to defend the interests of working people wherever they might be. That's great. And I think another question that sort of we haven't touched on, but I know it's sort of part of our general council statement, and that's sort of we talked a little bit about Northern Ireland and border in Northern Ireland, yeah. about Gibraltar, and that's you know something that yeah. it didn't come up as much during the referendum, and I think a lot of people may not be familiar with the issues, but I know sort of Unite has done yeah. a conference there and sort of has done some work there, so I just wanted you to explain a little bit on that. Yeah, I mean, we're all familiar with the Northern Ireland yeah. uh, situation, of course, and the default position, um, as far as the European Union are concerned, is uh, if there is no settlement to the border question, the border will be in the Irish Sea. Yeah. Um, in order to protect a customs union and a single market, free movement of workers and free trade, mm. uh, but on the island of Ireland. Mm. Uh, that's the EU's position, and it's up to the... UK government to come up with an alternate solution, if indeed there is one, yeah. uh, to protect the border between the EU and the UK uh, once we leave. And that's a very sensitive and incredibly difficult uh, solution to find. That's the reality of it. Um, but that's in the government's hands and the governments believe that they can find that solution, we'll let them get on with it, and we'll challenge them all the way to make sure that it benefits working people. In Gibraltar it's a little different, of course, because uh, uh, Gibraltar is on the tip of Spain mm -hmm. and um, they're our members. Uh, in Gibraltar, and you're right, we've had a conference in Gibraltar talking to our members about the impact of Brexit on them. Mm -hmm. uh, the European Union have given the Spanish government a veto on any deal mm -hmm. uh, in relation to Gibraltar, so there must now be a, a bilateral agreement between the UK government and the Spanish government yeah. on the future of uh, Gibraltar. And that's creating some sensitivities and concerns in mm -hmm. Gibraltar for obvious, uh, for obvious reasons. Mm -hmm. There is a border there, there are often complications which Spanish workers enter in Gibraltar. Mm -hmm. uh, Gibraltar is reliant upon the Spanish community that mm -hmm. surrounds it for workforce and uh, you know Gibraltar supports the economy mm -hmm. uh, of that region of Spain uh, to a large extent. Uh, and so there is a political imperative really on the part of the Spanish and the UK mm -hmm. government to find a solution to that, a political solution to that. But it is with government uh, right now. Uh, We've made representations to government to say that working people should be party to those discussions. That you should have a, you know, a trade union presence mm -hmm. through the TUC at those negotiations, uh, both with the EU and some of these separate negotiations as well, to make sure that ordinary citizens, working people's views, are at the forefront of any discussions taking place. Uh, they've done it in Canada. Canada's a good example. In Canada, they're in discussions now with the United States on a new North American free trade mm -hmm. agreement with Mexico, Canada and the United States. The Canadian delegation includes trade unionists. Mm -hmm. uh, at every step of the way, uh, the Trudeau government has been clear that the voice of working people will be at the front of uh, those negotiations. And trade union leaders are party to the official Canadian government delegations. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, what a breath of fresh air that would be if yeah. we could convince our government that we had a valid, legitimate voice on behalf of the millions of workers that we represent. But of course, ideologically, they're not in the same place as the Trudeau uh, government. It's up to us now to force them uh, yeah. to change their position. 
All right, uh, we have another question again from Lawrence about uh, sort of you mentioned reps negotiating written agreements with employers to secure workers' rights. Could you expand on that? What type of things are the sort of reps doing in Unite? What type of things sort of reps all across trade union movement should look at as an example? And I think, you know, I'm just going to put a little plug off your Unite's Brexit check website. Yeah. And I think there's a lot of stuff there that you can go into more details in terms of sectors, in terms of what reps can yeah. do. And I think TUC would be doing more on sort of reps guides, but... Okay. Yeah, we have the Inside Unite, we have the Brexit um, checklist site. Mm -hmm. Anybody can access that. Um, and it's uh, loaded with information actually coming back from our, our representatives in work sites across the country, uh, covering just about every sector of the economy. Mm -hmm. uh, and they're relaying to us uh, what they're doing, uh, what the challenges are, what their employers are proposing, sometimes very opportunistically, of course, yeah. uh, using their exit from the European Union as a mechanism for attacking our terms and conditions, rights that we might uh, have obtained over many years, sometimes by agreement with the employer, or indeed even in the worst cases, paying conditions uh, of our members, of course. So employers have their own uh, uh, agenda in some cases, and that's not necessarily in our members' interests. So our members are feeding that in mm -hmm. um, to Brexit check, uh, we're then feeding that back out again uh, by way of model agreements uh, that our members could utilise uh, in the best way that they can locally, taking the best bits of those agreements and adding in bits that they think are relevant to their own workplace or the companies that they work for, indeed the sector that they work um, in. We've never relied uh, just on the law um, mm. to improve the situation for working people. Yeah. The reality is the law is helpful, but laws come and go. Uh, governments change, laws change. Um, we want to see hard and fast agreements signed between ourselves and the employers uh, that we represent mm -hmm. um, you know, to ensure that those rights are enshrined in proper collective agreements. Mm -hmm. So any rights that we've been able to secure uh, by way of our membership of the European Union right now should be identified uh, and the subject of a written agreement between ourselves and our employers mm -hmm. to protect those rights post-Brexit. Because we're not comfortable with just the UK government saying that oh, well, all those rights will transpose into UK legislation on the day we leave the European Union. And then at the same time talking about ministers having you know, the rights to just at the swipe of a pen remove some of those yeah. protections. Well, I don't see many Tory ministers working to the benefit of ordinary working people. Mm -hmm. So the reality is, whilst we're running into this exit from the European Union, yeah. we've got to make sure that we're enshrining the rights that we currently enjoy in law into agreements with our employers. Yeah. And there are model agreements on the Brexit check website. I'm right. sure the TUC are doing right very yeah. well. And I think, you know, if if you if reps are out there, check out the Brexit check. I think there are a lot of information there. Yeah. And I think, you know, TUC would be putting out more information. We hope this webinar and webinars like it on specific areas are sort of, you know, spaces where you can come and ask questions, yeah. find out more interact with other reps because you know so much of the learning is between reps you should sort of union tries and the TUC tries to bring that together but reps talking to each other is where sort of as, as, a, yeah. as, as a former rep and a rep that's where a lot of things you know a lot of areas where you just go you just message someone and you know more experienced reps have dealt with the issue they come back to you yeah, yeah. and you use that learning there and I think that's gonna be it for us I just wanted to plug next week's is it next week? Next week, 2nd of May webinar, and that yeah. would be on the gender pay gap. We had sort of, you know, the news of gender pay gap reporting, and that's, you know, some, depending on sort of the size of the union, some unions have to do it compulsorily. Other unions and workplaces may have chosen to do it, and employers have sort of over a certain size have to do it, and I think that's an area that has opened up a lot of questions and a lot of, you know, discussions about rights and discrimination in the workplace, and, you know, the gap that exists and that's on 2nd of May at 2.30 and you can find it on sort of TC webinars website and um, thank you so much for joining us and thank you to Steve for coming here. Thank Pleasure. You. Thank you. Bye. Thanks.